take two, roll two. Interview with Davis. What do you mean by uh, you have a fear of the unknown? Well, um, I often uh, wonder how I survived for the first two or three years in Vietnam. And if you don't know what's going to happen, if you go into a, an action and you don't know how to react to a situation which may develop, um, that is fear of the unknown. If you don't have a fair idea of the way the other man on the other side is thinking, all sorts of tiny little things. One is, uh, I've often seen soldiers on the side of the line I've been, who pick a target. They get it in their mind that they're going to kill that man because there's something about him. He's wearing an odd colored shirt or something, not just a military shirt. Or he's got a funny sort of hat on, or there's something about him which picks, picks him. And that happens quite often. One man will get set that he wants to kill that man. And he'll track him and track him and track him in an engagement. And that happened to me a couple of times. Well, and you were the target? Or I, you was were the target. I, was, <laughs> I was the target. And, but by that time, I knew what he was doing. And the soldiers with me knew what he was doing and they helped me get out of it. Because despite the fact that there were thousands of rounds of all sorts of weapons, uh, coming from all sorts of weapons, going back and forth, that when a man is actually, one man has actually targeted you and trying to kill you, it's quite frightening. That is something you have to be very wary of. And you can, despite all that gunfire, you can pick the man or the fact that, a, that whenever you show yourself fleetingly, that there's one bullet comes awfully close and you sort of hear an open sound from the weapon, which means it's facing directly to you. It's, it's a slightly different sound to the other. It's almost like the bullet that's got its name marked for you. And well, you know. yes, and then he's after you. And uh, How'd um, you get away from that? Well, on one particular occasion, I mean, I, I thought that was happening and I'd, I tested it two or three times that it was. And I was with the Cambodian soldiers and they said, oh, oh, Davey, they, they're after you. And I said, yes, well, they are. And my friend, who was a Korean in the next paddy field, was retreating with his troops because the, the communist troops were trying to encircle us. And he called out to me, get back, get back because we're being encircled this way. And I felt a bit of a fool and though I knew what he'd know what I meant, I said, I can't, there's somebody trying to kill me. And <laughs> well, I mean, the air was full of rounds and, uh, and uh, but he knew what I meant. And on that occasion, the Cambodian soldiers with me said, okay, um, See so if you've got to target him again, find where he is, we'll watch, and then lay it down on him and just run. And I did show myself again, and sure enough, bang, he came through. And they said, right, got him, go. And they laid down the fire, and I ran, and I got out of it. Mm -hmm. And then they retreated. Uh -huh. Other than the fear of the unknown, have you experienced fear otherwise? Not really, actually. I mean, I hesitate to say that, because many people say the man who doesn't fear, feel fear feel fear is a fool. Let's start um, again. Yes. Go ahead. You can, have uh, you experienced fear other than the fear of the unknown? Uh, I hesitate to admit it, but I haven't actually, except on one occasion. And um, I know a lot of people will say that the man who doesn't feel fear is a fool. But I think that uh, you feel excitement and apprehension, and many people mistake that for fear. If you're afraid, I don't think you can control it. You're away and running, you're gone. You can't control your actions. And only on one occasion did I feel that, and it wasn't in combat. It was after a combat. And I walked into a very nice wood. It was like the bush, what we'd call the bush. And the Viet Cong had retreated, and they'd, a lot of their dead were left along this jungle trail, and a lot of the wounded had stopped and died there. And it was a sort of thing like Hansel and Gretel, where they left the the, the corn on the way, you know, the bodies were spread out like that along the... and the birds were chirping and it was an eerie feeling and I was alone, I'd just gone into there alone to just to see the way they'd retreated and to take some film and I suddenly had an overwhelming fear and I ran away. But that was going back to your instinct again, isn't it? Uh, yes, well I'm not certain because I don't think the Viet Cong were in there still. Okay. I mean there were troops ahead of me, uh, a long way ahead of me, but they'd cleared that area now, I don't think it was fear that there was, that there was uh, the enemy, the Viet Cong, were actually there physically and alive and waiting for me. I think it was, it was something unknown or almost supernatural, which I didn't, I didn't like, and I was very afraid, mm -hmm. and I ran. 
What about feelings of invincibility? Yes, and that's something one must guard against. Uh, because when you develop this instinct of knowing what to do at the right time that seems to work all the time, you come back alive after all, and you've made what appear to be the right decisions, there can be a very dangerous feeling of in invincibility. That is, um, that you think you know it all and you think that you can't, everybody else may be killed, but you can't. And whenever I felt that, I took stock of myself. Uh, very severely have and you was very careful. Have you known other correspondents, cameramen, who have taken advantage of that to their own yes, demise? Yes, and they are dead. Mm. They are dead. You managed to uh, get in with the Viet Cong at one stage. Uh, can you mm. tell me any experiences from that that stand out? Well, the first experience, the first thing they told me, um, which I was interested to hear, because I believed it, was that the South Vietnamese soldiers they were opposing were the best soldiers um, on our side, as one might say. I know it was uh, fashionable for the Americans and the other allies to blame the South Vietnamese army for the losses in Vietnam over the years. But in fact, uh, they fought very well. They had uh, a lot of things going against them early, but after about 1968, they fought very, very well, and the Viet Cong acknowledged that. What was their attitude towards the Americans? The Americans they used to call the elephants. They said they bumble around, you can hear them coming a mile off. And uh, they could smell them too, smell their shave cream and toothpaste and cigarettes and things like that. It goes down to a very animal instinct almost, which is yes, war, I guess. Yes, and the Viet Cong also made some fatal errors, which they admitted. They made the error of thinking that they were invincible, but because of their developed or recaptured instincts, that they and uh, were on top of the situation. And they admitted that they made that mistake several times as the South Vietnamese Army. And the South Vietnamese uh, had that instinct also. And so they were over to counter the Viet Cong. I know that, uh, but uh, when I was with the Viet Cong, a helicopter went over, a South Vietnamese helicopter, very high, and I could see that it was a gunship, one that's really lethal. They didn't pay any attention. I, I was watching it closely because I'd never been attacked from the air. Okay. But a few minutes later, it started to come back. And that time, instinctively, they knew that there was something wrong. I thought it was just doing a wheel around was going back. I wasn't concerned. But they were. And they said, watch it, watch it. And uh, they watched it closely. And it appeared to be going past. And then it started to tilt. As soon as it tilt, they said, D, D, Mao, go, go quickly. And everybody ran in 360 degrees. And that helicopter comes screaming down and rattling with its guns and rockets and really letting go. What sort of firepower has it got? Tremendous firepower. It has many, what they call minigun, banks of four machine guns mounted, and it's four and four. So you've got 16 machine guns coming at you, and if you're on top of the ground, you're dead. Uh, it lays down such a pattern, about 6,000 rounds a minute. What sort of... Uh... A calibre of the same calibre as the uh, M16, um, more or less the same mm -hmm. as the Australian FN rifle. Mm -hmm. So you managed to get away? How did you do that? Well, we, we got away. We uh, soldier grabbed me and, and, uh, and we ran. In its first strafing run, it strafed where we had been. But fortunately, there was almost nobody there. And a uh, few people were killed as they were running into the jungle. And then as it wheeled to come back in its second run, we picked ourselves up and managed to get to a jungle bunker. And that was reinforced with uh, saplings on the top. And he strafed for about 30 minutes up and down. And I was sure that it was going to break through, but it, but it didn't. And uh, what, would, what did the uh, area look like once it had finished? Oh, I was just devastated. All the leaves and branches hanging off the trees, and some of the trees were cut in half from the force of the of the uh, firepower. And uh, mm. you know, craters in the ground. Mm. How did you get back your film to the other side? Well, <coughs> when I was about to go, uh, the soldiers, Viet Cong soldiers, took me to the took me to within half a mile of a main highway. Then they said, of course, if we can't take you any further because there'll be a clash with the forces, South Vietnamese forces, who already know you're in here. That's a different story, how they knew I was in there. And they're waiting to arrest you. But the, s the children will take you, children aged 9 to 12, roughly. And they skipped along playing their games. They knew what they are doing. And leading me into a village right on the road, 